Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I would like to start by thanking the organizers for uh, inviting me and uh, probably also uh, Professor Lowen. Um, so it's a great pleasure to give a talk here in Antwerp, unfortunately, um, online. It would be nice as a former student to come back to the campus. Um, but of course, as you know, that is not uh, possible now. So uh, let's uh, jump right into it. So if I would have to give you the standard reference in our field, then uh, it is this book. So it's called Tame Topology and Ominimal Structure. Ominimal Structures by uh, Professor Lau van Andries, a Dutch, Dutch mathematician. And um, so you could call it the book Ominimality for Dummies. And so um, first of all, probably you are wondering Tame Topology, what does that mean? Uh, so I will explain that or roughly explain that in the, in the next slide. It's also important to mention that even though uh, Professor van Andries is uh, very influential in this field, and of course this book is, uh, he did not invent this theory, but has uh, contributed a lot to it. Um, and so who did actually uh, introduce the field, let's say, or uh, discovered um, or minimal structures? So this was uh, started with a series of papers, so they call uh, definable sets in ordered structures. Uh, by Pile and Steinhorn, and there are actually uh, three papers. And so in one of the papers, there is also uh, Julia Knight involved. Uh, and finally, so as you may know from the, um, well, from the topic of these two talks, it's, uh, it's situated in model theory, um, but you will notice that um, well, I'm, we'll talk more about applications, and then uh, there is also a lot of algebra uh, and analysis involved. Okay. Um, so what is good about this book, before I go to the next slide, is that it does not use uh, model theory. So it, it's written in a geometric way, let's say. Uh, but unfortunately, that's also the, the, the downside of the, of the book, is that it does not use model theory, because then some results um, require a more complicated proof. So it's an advantage and a disadvantage, in my opinion. OK, so what is a thing topology? So as I have explained, um, I should explain you, uh, but there is not a, a real definition. So here's a quote out of a, let's say, famous, very famous um, research proposal by Rotenbeek. So probably some of you will know it. Um, and I've highlighted some important uh, words in this, this piece. So um, I can um, summarize it as saying he uh, noticed this work by Hiram Maka, and he studies semi-analytic sets. And he thought, well, these sets have nice properties. And so these nice properties you can call, uh, he called in French, topologie modérée. Uh, and so we call it uh, tame topology in English. So what is the idea of this talk? Or what should you uh, remember from this talk is that uh, minimality uh, implies tame, geom uh, tame not geometry or topology. Now, since the right-hand side is not a precise definition, this is not a, a theorem in any way. It's more a philosophy. OK, so that's the history and motivation for now. Let us jump into the definition. So um, here's the definition. It might seem a little bit scary with uh, words you don't know. So what is an O-minimal structure? So it is a structure M, and it's, uh, well, one-dimensional definable sets are just um, unions, finite unions of intervals and points. Um, and there is also another part of the statement. So this uh, structure should be an L structure, where L is some language where we have an order symbol. And, and it should also well be a model of the theory of dense linear order. So I will explain that in a minute. So uh, let me explain what is a language. So a language is just a bunch of symbols uh, for functions and relations, uh, but also for constants, in fact, and that you use to define a set. So uh, you are used to defining a set using some uh, formula. So I've given an example here. Uh, so this is an example. And so I want at least to be the order. I want to be able to write the order. Uh, what does it mean to be a model of this theory of dense linear orders um, without endpoints? So I think. You have an idea what that means just because you are familiar with many other words. So it's a total order. Um, just think about the rationals or the reals. Uh, and I've added another example just to indicate that this order 
uh, does not uh, necessarily um, should be the one of the real. So it could be non archimedean that's what I want to say. And so a set is definable. So you have heard this in the last talk. Uh, so in this definition, uh, I say a set is definable if there is some formula for um, the set. OK. So um, in this talk, I will look at a real structure. So the underlying set is just uh, the one of the real numbers. Most of the time, I will use at least the language of ordered rings. So you can do addition and multiplication. Um, that's what you should uh, remember from this definition. Um, and there is a, a technical condition that you want definable means definable with parameters. Uh, so this actually means that you have a constant symbol for each uh, real number. If you want, you can then, for instance, multiply uh, by pi instead of just 0 and 1 as indicated in the language uh, above. So for example, this would then be a definable subset of R. Uh, OK. And then um, something you might notice uh, about these sets is that they are closed on their Boolean operations. So this is something you can uh, imagine that it is, um, they are geometric operations. So um, let me now give you an interesting uh, definition, or let's say a more uh, down to earth definition. So it's what I would call the geometric definition of an O-minimal structure. So what do we have now? So it is the data of, um, for every n, a collection of subsets of the R to the power n. And they should be, of course, closed under some operations. So first of all, uh, you can take uh, intersections and so on. So it is a Boolean algebra. Uh, but finite intersections, finite unions, and complements, and so on. So um, we also want diagonals. So that means, um, for instance, the set A1 equals Xn is a definable set or, or belongs to the structure. Um, and we also want project projections and a product. So that is a structure. And then from a structure, we can say that it is O minimal. So uh, the O stands for order. So we want the order relation and this. Uh, case it really means the order relation as you know it, the Euclidean order if you want. And we want that this um, induces a minimal amount of sets, uh, so not too many. And so this means all sets in S1 uh, are finite unions of intervals and points, just as we had before. And so this part of the definition actually tells you that it is more or less the same as being an L structure. Um, and this the fifth axiom then says, well, we want the order relation in our language. Or oh, there was a, well. And so the, the minimal property is, of course, the same. So I will start with non examples of all minimal structure. So, um, so remember, I'm always looking at the real. So suppose that we have um, that the sine function is definable. So that means that the graph of the sine function um, belongs to uh, S2, if you want. So then it is not going to be all minimal. Because with this uh, graph, you can then construct the set uh, sine of x is 0. And so that generates a set that is obviously um, not a finite union of intervals and points. So this is not O minimal then. And so the idea is that if you have the, the sine function or the entire sine function, then you can create bad geometry. So not something like this. And another example is uh, that Q as a field is not O minimal. And so it's already known by a theorem of Julia Robinson that there is a definition, uh, first order formula for integers uh, uh, in Q. Uh, but it is a theorem, in fact, that uh, so if an O minimal structure, let's say, general, generates a field, so that means uh, some plus and uh, multiplication are definable, and the set then uh, becomes a field, uh, then an O minimal. A structure should be at least a real closed field. Uh, and real closed means that uh, it's very close to being algebraically closed. So you just have to add uh, some imaginary number. All right. So now let us see at some actual examples. So I start with um, a trivial example, if you want. So you just take the order, as I said before, and then we are only going to do addition. Uh, and I've also said that we use constant symbols, so that will mean that we can also multiply if you want, or you cannot even multiply in this case. Anyway, so you will get something that looks like an ordered vector space since you can do addition. Um, 
And so you get some things that looks like um, linear sets. And so it is not so hard to believe that is O minimal. Um, so these are the first examples. So what do we know uh, about O minimal structures? Um, in fact, they are always one of the three following um, structures. So locally, so locally in the usual way that every point has some open neighborhood. And then it induces some geometry, let's say, whatever that means. So it is trivial, so there are no actually uh, interesting functions. Secondly, it is actually the last example, which is also not very interesting. And then there is a third case where, um, so you get an O minimal expansion of a real closed field. So that would be, um, let's say, at least the uh, interesting examples I am going to show you in a minute. So, but before I go on, I'm wondering, are there any questions about the definition of an O minimal structure or of the examples that I've given so far? Since could you say just a few more words about the last slide? It was a, a bit fast to follow what the what was being said there for me. Yes. So uh, can I go back? So this one you mean? So it, yeah. Yes. Yes. So it basically says that it's not a real classification theorem. Um, let's say especially since the third one that can be pretty wild. So it, it basically says that uh, if you look in a neighborhood of a point, what functions do you have? So either it is really nothing interesting or it is something linear. And if not, then it can be anything. But it's either of these three. And that is what it says. Is that more clear? I'm not sure. I'm assuming that for now it's mostly a, a sketch of saying, OK, we understand these structures quite well without Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, thanks. Not, not the meaning. It is, is a formal definition or something, just to give you an idea. And the topology is uh, induced by this uh, order, like you take as uh, open yes, yes, uh, intervals. Yes, that is a great uh, remark. Yes, so the topology is just a Euclidean topology induced by this order. Thank you. Okay, so let's go on. So um, as I said, we will always look at the language of ordered rings. So we can now multiply. Um, so for instance, I've drawn some pictures of what the definable sets look like. Um, so I, I think you could already come up with these examples yourself. Um, and so you see that if you take the, the sets that are definable with this language, they well, seem to be semi-algebraic sets. And so in fact, uh, this is not a definition. I think many of you have an idea of what semi-algebraic means, and so you should show that's for every semi-algebraic set, you actually have a definition um, in this language. So that's why I've put that it's actually a theorem rather than a definition. Uh, but now we most of the time just use it as a definition. So from one side, it is actually clear that if you uh, take semi-algebraic sets, that they, um, well, they are by definition Boolean combinations of polynomials, let's say. So since you can do this with this uh, language structure, um, you get this inclusion. So how to prove the converse? That's slightly more difficult because, well, you can just write some formula and then even uh, make them more complicated. So what, let's see uh, for an example. Um, so also in the previous talk, we had quantifiers. So uh, quantifiers that uh, boils down to projections. Of course, uh, our structure is closed under projections, just as um, I have stated in this geometric definition. Um, but this makes your sets more complicated since so they can be projections of sets as well. And so how do you know that this is again um, semi-algebraic, for instance? And probably uh, you have already an idea what I mean. So we need a result on projections of semi-algebraic sets. What, what are they? And so you uh, know very well probably the tasky seidenberg theorem. So it exactly says that the projection of a semi-algebraic set is uh, semi-algebraic. So in terms of model theory, we call this quantifier elimination. So recall my example of the previous slide, where I have written there exists a y such that um, y squared is x, but that just means that x is a, let's say, a positive number. 
So you can write it in a different way without a, a quantifier. So that is really nice. So you always have a formula that is uh, well, then just consists of symbols in your language. That's the idea. And um, this is not true for just algebraic sets because, uh, well, by the above, um, this is um, an algebraic definition, if you want, that you can write it without this equality symbol, inequality symbol. Um, and so by this theorem, let's say, of course, this is just a short ID, you get uh, the other inclusion. So you should remember from the semi-algebraic sets that this idea of having quantifier elimination or closure under projections, that this is um, requires some work. Um, and essentially, this is the task is um, And so by this result, you see that semi-algebraic sets are no minimal structure on R. And so actually, I could have also uh, put them as a elementary example, but I think they are already sufficiently interesting to put as a non-trivial example. Okay, so now let's go to a more complicated example. So I have to introduce some additional uh, language or terms. So a restricted analytic function is, well, as the name says, a restriction of an analytic function. Uh, more precisely, it should be a restriction of a function that is open on an open neighborhood of a compact set, if you want. So, and then we add it, uh, we, we define it to be zero outside uh, this compact set. Uh, the idea is that we will avoid bad behavior at infinity. And so we create a language with this. So we just add to this language of ordered rings a symbol for any restricted analytic function. Uh, so as I said, the idea is that we uh, make sure that the behavior at infinity is okay. So for example, you can already see that you cannot add the entire sign function, uh, which we did not like. And so uh, the LN structure R, we denoted RM, and you can prove that it is O minimal. Um, but to prove what it actually is, I'll have to introduce more definitions. So it is a semi-analytic set. Well, it's the same idea as a semi-algebraic set. So it's a set of the form that is well, locally given by uh, functions, uh, equations, and in inequalities and intersections of this. Um, so rather than polynomials, you are now allowed to use uh, analytic functions. And then um, we go a step further. So you can say a set is sub-analytic if it is locally a projection of a bounded semi-analytic set. Um, and so you might think sub-analytic, and I just said what sub-analytic is, so that will probably agree, but that is not the case. So for instance, the graph of the sine function is uh, sub-analytic. Uh, and the point is this behavior and infinity. So we're going to solve this, or you can consider this map. So it just maps R into the unit cube if you want. Um, and then you call a set globally subanalytic if it is uh, subanalytic if you apply this map to it. So uh, perhaps some of you might phrase this as it is subanalytic to some product of projective uh, spaces over the reals. It's the same. So now uh, the projection of a globally subanalytic set is globally subanalytic, so that's good news. Um, the hardest part in showing, uh, in showing that this is a structure, actually, so you sh should show that globally subanalytic sets satisfies this list of geometric axioms. And so the hardest part is showing that the complement of a subanalytic set is again subanalytic. So this is due to Gabrielov. And this is actually the second important tool to showing that uh, um, a structure is O minimal. Um, and so you can show that globally subanalytic sets is the same as being uh, L undefinable, as I've uh, explained before. So this theorem of the complement of Gabrielov is an important uh, ingredient. So other O minimal structures, so you can take um, L X, so you take the ordered ring language and you just add one extra symbol, namely for the entire exponential function. So this is something not subanalytic. And so you can take the corresponding L extra structure on uh, the reals. And this is an O minimal structure. So that might not surprise you. The exponential function is, of course, a nice function. When it is O minimal, it's a theorem by uh, Wilkie. And then you can do something actually special. So if you just take the smallest structure that contains the subanalytic sets and this, what we sometimes call exponential algebraic sets, 
then again, you get uh, an O minimal structure, but um, this does not work in general. So the, um, you cannot just uh, take the smallest uh, structure that contains two structures, then in general, it might not be O minimal. So in fact, why is that? There is a theorem that any smooth function can be written as a sum of two different functions, uh, each of which is definable in some O minimal structure. And so you can clearly imagine some smooth functions that you don't, don't want, for instance, a sine function. And so the sine function is the sum of two functions that each are definable in some O minimal structure. So clearly you cannot merge the two into some smallest O minimal structure that contains both of them. And so that's the idea why you cannot in general expect that this works. Okay, let's see a more example. So R just denotes semi-algebraic sets. And then you have this increasing sequence if you want. So our exp I've already explained. Um, I don't have, I think I'm running a little bit behind, so I'll not really explain the other ones. Maybe I've heard of Pfaffian functions. So they are functions that satisfy polynomial differential equations, let's say. And um, this is the structure that will uh, induce a structure called R path. More importantly, is going down, let's say, um, so adding uh, subanalytic functions. And so um, I've explained most of these. Um, between these um, structures, there is something uh, called RW. You could see them as some specific class of analytic functions that you want to add, but not all of them. Uh, and R to the power K is uh, adding some irrational powers, in, uh, essentially. So these are not analytic, so you should add them separately if you want them. And so they do not cause any problems in terms of co-minimality. So what is the idea? If you want to go to the, to the right-hand side in this picture, you usually use this theorem by Spiesegger. So the Pfaffian enclosure of an O-minimal structure is O-minimal. That's his uh, theorem. Um, and vertically, let's say, it's a resolution of singularities, but then for analytic functions. And so you, there exist bigger structures. So um, RCM, RN star, and RG not really explain what they are, but they are, let's say, uh, generalizations of these uh, two key ingredients that I have explained. So they have quantifier elimination. You can show uh, a Gabrielov theorem of the complement. So basically, this is due to the fact that they form some class of, of functions that you can uh, embed injectively into um, a ring of power series. So they, their Taylor series does not converge but uh, it is sufficient to do operations with it and then you can um, apply the same methods, let's say. And this has been written down in actually a very precise paper in 2015 by Rollin and Servi. Um, and so uh, nearly all of these structures have been proved to be minimal in the, let's say, same way. So you prove, construct a more general notion of uh, semi-analytic sets and sub-analytic sets and so on. And so you can also enlarge these structures again with X or even FAF if you want. And so this uh, Professor Spicer is very influential in the field since he has been involved in all the structures I have just uh, enlarged. So he has had a, quite a contribution to our field. So you might wonder uh, what functions uh, live in these structures. So um, I'll explain later. For algebraic geometry, you need at least R and X. Um, for instance, a Weierstrass function of an elliptic curve that is definable in Rm, but if you want to study in, in families, you need the exponential function. Uh, the gamma function is definable in this Rg exp, at least uh, the positive part, and the, the Riemann zeta function, at least if you restrict it um, on the positive side to one, is definable in um, R stan, R and star exp. So this is just to give you an idea where some uh, functions live. So in general, you need quite a big O minimal structure already to um, obtain an interesting function, but you do indeed obtain uh, interesting functions. So again, this is a moment where you can ask questions if you want. Uh, yes, uh, one question. Uh... About the uh, Riemann zeta function, does this prove that there are only finitely many zeros uh, in this interval? No, uh, I'm not mistaken, the strip is not uh, included in the domain. So I guess people want to uh, have a thought about this, but uh, no. 
Uh, yes, but the the more simple results actually in this interval where it's defined, it has no zeros. But can you already see from the fact that it's uh, definable there that it has at most finitely many? I don't know. Mm. Don't know. I just know that it uh, lives there, and um, mm -hmm. if you want, I can. Uh, give you a reference for this paper, but I, I'm not sure what they um, then eventually do with it. Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So then I will go on. What can you do with open master? So I just give, I've given you examples, but what can you actually do with them? So first of all, um, I'll talk about is a uh, thin geometry. So first of all, um, if a function is definable, so it means that the graph of this function is a definable set, then you can decompose its domain into finitely many points and intervals. So as you recognize their own minimality, such that the restriction to these intervals is um, either a constant function or a strictly monotone function. And so you can do better, you can also say instead of monotone, continuous, um, differentiable, and so you can repeat this ID. And so again, clearly this is false from the sine function. So it's not definable in any four-minimal structure. So let's go on. Another important theorem in this uh, theory is the um, uniform finiteness lemma. So I'm just going to draw a, a picture, or I don't have the picture in this case. So what does it say? Um, whenever you have, let's say, uh, fibers that exist of finitely many points for, for um, or some parameter of family of a, uh, yeah, if you have a family, definable family of finitely many points, and um, then these finitely many points will have a uniform bound. That is what it says. And so usually in O minimality, whenever for every parameter you have something finitely many, it means that you can find a uniform bound on this uh, number. So that is a useful ingredient that I will use uh, very soon. So the main um, important structure in a no minimal structure is the, the notion of a cell. So cells are going to be the building blocks of definable sets. So a cell in uh, R1, if you want, is just a point or an, uh, an open interval where the endpoint can be plus or minus infinity. And then you uh, define inductively a cell in higher dimensions as follows. So either you take the graph of a continuous definable function and then uh, this is a cell, a higher dimensional cell, but it has the same dimension, but it lives in a higher dimension. That is what I wanted to say. Or you take the region between two of these graphs, uh, where, of course, one function should always be uh, smaller than the other function. So I've um, added two pictures as an example. So I, I believe that gives a good idea of how you construct cells. And so you repeat this. And it's clear, for instance, that this first curve dimension one and the open cell in R2 has dimension two. And so they are always connected because of this condition on the function f that they should be strictly smaller than g. And it is clear what their dimension is. If you choose for option two, then the dimension increases. And if you choose for option one, the dimension does not increase. So that is the idea. So these are cells. As I said, they are the building blocks for definable sets. So this is the Cell decomposition theorem, which is the uh, very important theorem in all minimality. Maybe the reason why it is interesting. So suppose the set is definable, then it is a finite union of cells. That's a nice uh, result. Uh, and also for functions, there is a version, so you can decompose its domain such that the restriction is continuous. So you recognize in this, uh, this theorem of lemma I've shown before, uh, but in a stronger version and for uh, multivariate functions. So the cell decomposition theorem it is completely equivalent to this uh, condition on the one-dimensional sets. So for one-dimensional sets, it doesn't say anything interesting. We are just imposed as an axiom that they should be finite unions of cells. Um, but so it is also implies that I, all higher dimensional cells uh, sets are in fact finite unions of what we call cells. Um, so that is a strong property. And so we use this uh, theorem in basically any proof in all minimality, I think. And so a proof goes as follows. 
usually we have some definable set x and then we decompose um, as many times as we like, finitely many times of course, and then probably we will end up with some uh, finitely many cells that are, let's say, um, really, really good. So your function might uh, satisfy a lot of properties or some balance relation might be true or um, let's say definable things uh, will be satisfied or might not be satisfied. Uh, but if they're not satisfied, usually it's a closed condition, so the dimension drops, and you can use induction. Um, because the cells are defined by induction, we do uh, many proofs using cell decomposition and then induction on the dimension of the cells. Okay, so another important result is definable choice. So, well, it says if you have some sets, you can make a choice function if you want. So as a picture, it would look like this. Um, so x is a subset of rn plus m, and so you can make a function from rn to rn that uh, assigns to each uh, x a fiber, let's say. So you can imagine this picture. Um, and so you may assume, so this means use cell decomposition, that is um, f is actually continuous, and so you have a very strong version of the axiom of choice if you want. With, yeah. So that is uh, nice. So let me summarize this. Uh, so every set is a finite union of cells, which are just very simple sets. Every function is piecewise continuous. Um, definable properties, as I've mentioned before, are usually uniform. So this refers to this finiteness lemma. Um, you have a good version of the axiom of choice. What can we do more? So in many cases, um, well, I've already said that you can ask for uh, R times continuously differentiable. So in the cell decomposition theorem, iterate it, uh, apply it to the derivative of F. So then its derivative will become continuous and then you just repeat. And so you can get the uh, decomposition if you want. And in many cases, so nearly all of the examples that I have shown in this diagram, you actually have uh, well analytic cell decompositions. So all the involved functions in the definition of the cell uh, are analytic. There is also a, a triangulation theorem and a trivialization theorem. Um, some of you probably know better what this means, so I will not uh, really phrase what they say. And so this yields a foundation uh, for algebraic topology. So I've put uh, one reference if you are interested in this. So uh, higher homotopy groups, uh, homotopy of groups definable in O minimal structure. So I think in this paper, you'll also find many more references, references to um, this field, where so they try to combine O minimality with algebraic geometry. So I think that is uh, really nice. Before I go to the next section, let me mention, so the idea was that O minimality implies nice geometry. And so I've given you a few results that might convince you that um, definable sets in an O minimal structure are uh, easy to understand. And so uh, model theorists have tried uh, to generalize this to other structures. So O minimal structure, uh, most of the times it's, it's on the reals, and sometimes you, you're just not working with the reals. So can you do something else? So uh, as you see, I've listed many notions, and probably there are even more letters of the alphabet such that you have some um, minimal property. But not all of these has been, have been very successful. Um, in particular, um, uh, C minimal is an interesting notion, D minimal is an interesting notion. So they have a cell decomposition theorem and is useful, uh, but the others are not so clear. Um, now, H minimal is a very recent uh, development by my supervisor, Graf Klukers, I think last year this paper was uh, put on the archive. And so the H is for Hensel minimality, so you may already know that it's going to be something for Henselian fields. Uh, then you need the theory of multi-sorted languages because with a valued field, let's say, there comes a valuation which is not defined on the same set, so you also need a, a language for that, let's say. And it's also not so obvious what, um, what uh, a cell should be. So for the reals, points and intervals, this is clear and inspired, let's say, by uh, algebraic sets. But um, 
it's not so clear, for instance, for the Piatics, what should be our building blocks. Uh, for instance, uh, I think I've written down P minimal, and there is also a D minimal. I have tried to uh, generalize this O minimality or, or construct a, a version of O minimality on the Piatics, but so eventually they do not end up with uh, sufficient material or it's too hard to check. And so sometimes this is because of the definition of your uh, axiom. Well, what do you impose on the, on the sets? Uh, but sometimes you also need to get a good notion of what the cell is. So you also don't know what it should be. Um, okay. And then for handsome minimality, we do have a uh, cell decomposition. And um, there is a development of the applications that I will also mention uh, after this. And so um, not all um, generalizations are actually to be sought in um, just trying to find a structure and imposing um, some axiom on its, um, its one-dimensional sets, uh, but that would lead me too far. Um, but so model theorists are even um, trying to explain how O minimality is even implies nice geometry. So they're trying to even find more general uh, model theoretic approaches so that it implies uh, thin geometry. So other questions about this part. So this part was basically um, what is the thin geometry that you get from O minimality. All right, no questions so far. Good. Applications. So um, we are going to number theory. So the height of a rational point is basically some measure about how complicated it is. So it's just the absolute value of all um, enumerators and denominators occurring in these rational points, where, of course, their greatest common divisor is one. Uh, and then so we can define rational points on a set up to a certain threshold t. And uh, so the idea is that this approximates your set if you let t go to infinity. Uh, yes, that's what I just said, sorry. Uh, good. So the theorem I'm going to discuss is the periodic key counting theorem. It's a well-known theorem. And so it is about transcendental sets. So first of all, what is the transcendental part of a, um, uh, of a definable set? So the algebraic uh, part of a, of a definable set is just the union, is possibly an infinite union here, of all semi-algebraic sets of dimension at least one in X. Of course, dimension at least one, because otherwise you just take the union of all points. Um, but so, of dimension at least one. And uh, because you take an infinite union, in fact, this uh, algebraic part of X is not necessarily definable. So this causes some problems. And so it's complement in X you call uh, the transcendental part. And so we have the following theorem by Pila and Wilkie. And um, let me just translate it roughly. It says, um, well, it is here. So if X has many rational points, let's say, then it must have a semi-algebraic curve. That is actually the idea. So indeed, um, this, this um, number of rational points, this behavior to infinity, does tell me something about the set. So I'll now discuss a little bit about the proof method of this um, theorem. So the first part is a determinate method, which is uh, well developed over a few, maybe decades probably, by Bombiri and Pila. Um, so this is a first complicated statement, in my opinion. So it says the following. If you have some set X and you want to well, you want to find some hypersurfaces such that if you intersect the hypersurface with your set, you uh, have many of the rational points on this hypersurface. That's the idea. And so how many do you need in function of the degree of the hypersurfaces uh, you consider? And so um, you can compute some numerics if you want on this. So uh, it is t to the power epsilon uh, for any epsilon. Okay, mm, should I say anything else about this? Not yet, but moreover, you see that if, um, that if you take D large enough, of course, that's the idea. 
So if you let your hypersurface uh, be more complicated, then you can catch more rational points because essentially, uh, if you increase the degree of your hypersurface, algebraic hypersurface, uh, you have more variables of your polynomial. So you have, um, you can solve more equations. That's the idea. Um, so as I've said, if you pick D large enough, you can get epsilon as small as you want. So you then don't need so many hypersurfaces anymore. Uh, but there's of course a downside to this. For instance, in the theorem it is stated there exists some R and C. Uh, and so this C times T to the power epsilon, this constant C, uh, can become very large, but it does not depend on T. So this theorem does say something, let's say, about uh, behavior for very large T. Uh, and you cannot really do something else on C, it's just uh, because you have to compute a very large determinant and compute some upper bound, and you can expect that some very huge number will appear. And secondly, in the, in the statement, we have that X has to be the image of some, um, of some continuous map sufficiently smooth that has bounded derivatives. So this is a condition that I've not discussed yet. So you can wonder which sets satisfy this condition. So for which sets does this method work? So this is, of course, the second ingredient of this counting theorem is that if you have a set that is definable in an all-minimal structure, then you have finitely many, uh, you need finitely many of these maps, or even there exist finitely of these maps, finitely many of these maps that uh, do have this property. And so on each of these maps, to apply this result with hypersurfaces, and in this way you can eventually um, uh, prove the Pillar-Wilkie counting theorem. So what is uh, what can you do with this theorem? Because uh, I should explain to you, of course. So the the story of some applications is always if X contains many special points, whatever special means, then it must be special in itself. So in the field of algebraic geometry, then probably some uh, of you already know what I'm talking about. So for instance, the many Mumford conjecture. Uh, and also the Andre Ward conjecture, they are statements of this form. And so you can prove them in this way. Um, let me remark, I contribute the Andre Ward conjecture here to PILA, um, but of course there was already a proof before PILA, but I'm just saying that he uh, proved it using this counting theorem in 2009. So in fact, he got a clear research award for this in 2011 for this uh, nice new methods that can be in fact generalized uh, hopefully to uh, other uh, conjectures. So um, the idea is that the special points that I did not really define uh, correspond in some way to rational points. Um, for instance, in example one, there would be torsion points. And in the second statement, you will see that I've well just phrased it in terms of special points. So um, I guess specialists in the room probably know what a special point is in that case, better than I do. Okay, so I will roughly explain how this method works. I'm not a specialist in it, but I think it, the story is nice. So usually if you uh, have such a problem, then the, the, the set you are looking at is uh, parameterized by some interesting function. So I call this a uniformization map, J. And so you want that this J well, uh, is transcendental in some way. Not claiming that J is transcendental, but um, eventually this gives you a transcendental set. And so um, this is already a complicated part of the proof um, that uses again this counting theorem. So then by this counting theorem, um, you know that there are not so many rational points on a transcendental set. So it is sub polynomially many. Um, so I've written here, x for h, so the four means actually um, this is the degree of number fields. So I did not say this, but you can extend this notion of height to number fields, uh, and then you can prove the same statement over number fields. Um, and it says the same, so sub-polynomially many rational points on transcendental sets. Um, but on the other hand, and this is the, the idea of this proof strategy by Pila and Zanif, is that you try to play this play out this upper bound against a lower bound that comes from Galba theory. I really do not know 
anything about this. Uh, but so for every special point or rational point, then by this dictionary, you have at least uh, for some c, h to the power c, many uh, Galois conjugates. And so this is a problem. Uh, if you take h large enough, it contradicts this uh, pillar wilkie theorem because our set was transcendental. So that is roughly sketching the story of these uh, proofs. So if you are interested in them, of course, you will get the opportunity to ask questions, but these are uh, some very interesting references. So there is the original paper by Pila uh, in the Annals of Mathematics. Um, but this might be a very long paper, I think 80 pages or something. Um, but it, it might be worth if you are interested to look at the second reference, which is a survey paper that um, is really written with the aim for a broad, to be approachable for a broad audience. Um, so if you are interested in this, I recommend that you read this instead. It even includes all the model theory and all minimality. Okay, before uh, you get to ask questions, I'll state the conjecture. So it is uh, stronger than this counting theorem. So if you have a definable set that is definable in our exp, so call it uh, exponential algebraic, then the number of uh, rational points is even uh, bounded in a better way, let's say. And so we know that this is false for subanalytic sets because you can in some way construct uh, a subanalytic curve that has many rational points. Uh, this is already known for a while, but so for, exp for the exponential function, we expect that this does not generate sets with uh, many rational points. And uh, why are we interested in this conjecture? Well, because it would be easier to apply this strategy because we have a better upper bound, uh, so we can use a slightly worse lower bound. All right. So to finish this uh, section of applications, uh, the it's again the pillar will be counting theorem as recently also um, has an impact in uh, Hodge theory. So um, I have put a lot of references. Um, the idea is that you will use all minimality and uh, you uh, define a notion of definable spaces, uh, where spaces uh, means as in manifolds. So you have charts and transition maps should be definable in all minimal structure. And as I've said before, uh, definable then means in uh, R and exp, at least for these applications. Uh, and so what did they show about this? Um, well, I don't really know the precise content of these papers. There is an O minimal Gaga theorem, which I think is uh, well known what it means. Um, and, and various results on, um, well, basically that you can use this theory of O minimality to uh, algebraic geometry. And this, uh, briefly summarize what they do and then they can prove some conjectures with it. So this is recent work, so it's still on the archive, only the uh, last one is now published. Okay, so that um, leads me to uh, the last question moment before the end of the presentation. So other questions about these uh, applications in arithmetic geometry. Not immediately. Okay, then I will go on. So now we get to a part called parameterizations, and this is a, a field where I really work uh, in. So it will be a very small part of parameterizations, but then I share some of my own uh, work, or at least you have an idea where I um, do my researching. So here is a, another conjecture. So, um, well, what does it say? If you have a, a y that is definable in Rx, so this is um, a conjecture in light of the conjecture I've shown before. Uh, and it says that if you intersect your set with some family of uh, hypersurfaces, let's say, then it is mild. So I'm explain very soon what does that mean. But so the idea is that these constants uh, hold for all the family members of these uh, closed algebraic sets. So, and then another conjecture is that this conjecture implies Wilkie's conjecture, uh, but so it's a little bit weird because in the, in the same paper, there is a proof of the conjecture. So I'm not really sure if it is a conjecture or not, but okay. Uh, I have to explain you what is ABC mild. 
So what is ABC mild? It's a property of functions. So a smooth function is ABC mild if you can bound all order derivatives uh, by some formula in A, B, and C. And so uh, I'll just say C mild if it is uh, ABC mild for some A and B. So do you know these functions? Uh, well, yes, more or less. So if C is zero, this means uniform analytic. So what do I mean with uniform analytic? If a function is analytic, then it converges in some open neighborhood of this point. And so uh, uniform analytic means that you can pick, a, let's say the, the, the radius of convergence can be picked in it independently of the points. So there is some that works for all. Um, so, uh, and of course then it is not so hard to see that if F is analytic on an open neighborhood of a compact set, that it will be zero mild on an, uh, any open set contained in this uh, compact set. Uh, if you want an example of a function that is not zero mild, um, this is an example due to myself, basically, that this mildness is uh, 1 over kappa. So the best in literature was, in fact, 1 plus 1 over kappa, but you can uh, get arbitrarily close to zero. Uh, but this function is not analytic, so you cannot uh, definitely not get zero mild. So this, um, yeah, so using this uh, notion of mild functions, you can wonder can you write a set X as the image of finitely many functions that are mild? And so as you can already see it, uh, in the title of this slide, the answer would probably be no, because uh, I indicate that there are limits of O minimality. So I've already said that all O minimal structures in this talk had um, smooth cell decomposition, um, but it is known that there is an O minimal structure without cell decomposition. But so it took a while, which is a result of 2009, while O minimal structures are already uh, quite old. Um, and so by this result, of course, then you cannot expect that there will be a, a mild parameterization result because then that would imply also probably C infinite uh, cell decomposition. So the situation is in fact pretty bad. So for every C, you can find an O minimal structure and a set that is definable there that does not have a C mild parameterization. So this, this notion, um, so a, a set is mild if it has a C mild parameterization. And so the answer in general is no. So you don't have mild uh, sets in general. And so that does not mean that this is not the case in Rx as stated before. Um, so what do we know about about mild parameterizations. So if a set is subanalytic, then it has a zero mild parameterization. Uh, if you want to make this result uniform, so this subanalytic set would depend on parameters, so it's a, a bunch of uh, subanalytic sets, then you can construct a two a uniform two mild parameterization. So this means that um, these, these uh, values a and b that have, you have seen before do not depend on these parameters. So um, you get a family of maps that parameterize your family, and um, they all have the same upper bounds on their derivatives. And so you can do slightly better. So in this structure R and R, you um, can have uh, C mild parameterizations for arbitrary small c uh, for curves. And um, well, I've not done it yet, but I expect that you can do arbitrary close to one for higher dimensional sets because then actually this would correspond to this result in 2019. Uh, but the, the tricky part is here that um, these maps are not definable. So they are, they are definable, but in R and X, but not in the, in the structure that you have considered. And um, so if you want to use tools of model theory, then to say something about this in more generality, then this will fail. So what are problems? So problems in the field are, wide open questions. So is this the structure Rx? There is no better parameterization result than this CR parameterization theorem of Pila and Wilkie. And so this only says there are finitely many charts, but you don't know how much is finitely many. While for this, for instance, analytic sets, you do know this. Um, and another part is, so in this conjecture, you have seen that you have to intersect your set uh, Y with a uh, hypersurfaces, algebraic hypersurfaces. And so you need to know how many, for instance, connected components you will get. Uh, and so you, you do know 
goodies in our X or X or in this more general larger structure R F. Um, but so uh, this is not the case for subanalytic functions. Um, and so this is a problem because in general we want even a larger structure or an exp where these uh, applications for algebraic geometry live. And so um, yeah, and we really want a uniform result. And so this uniformity um, it does cause us problems, and you do need it probably for uh, for a, a proof of uh, Wilkie's conjecture on our exp. And so finally, you can wonder what about uniform zero mild parameterization. So I have none of the results said something about this because I have said that this um, each subanalytic set has a zero mild parameterization. But what if you consider a family of subanalytic sets and then it is not true? So um, there is an example of uh, sets. Uh, yes, the, see the animation is more or less uh, working. So it's this family of algebraic curves. Uh, um, hyperbolas. And so you can show because of this singular behavior at uh, zero that depends on this parameter epsilon. If you want to parameterize this, this uh, curve with analytic function, that this is not going to work. So the amount of charts are going to depend on epsilon, or the derivatives of the function are going to depend on epsilon. So this is a, a problem. And so this is a well known example by Yong Din that we do not have uniform zero mild parameterizations. And so in fact, my result implies that you do have a C mild parameterization of this curve for C uh, arbitrary small. And then I've come uh, to the end of my presentation. So thank you for listening and um, I'm very welcoming any questions. <laughs>